Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Rachel. And, you know, I went out on my morning stroll, as usual, this morning. And when I got down near the courthouse, I thought, you know, because it's a very, as you know, uh, my morning stroll is very contemplative. I don't, I'm not looking <laughs> at social media. I'm not checking tweets as I'm crossing streets and stuff. So I get down to the courthouse, and I, I literally see sleeping babies in the shadow of the courthouse. And I think, did they cancel the thing today? Is there no Trump nothing today? Is there just nothing? And, and then I come around the corner into the sunny spot, and I see, oh, okay, there they are. The, and I'm gonna, I want to overestimate this. I don't, I, I, maybe two dozen Trump supporters wow. there, maybe two dozen. And then at least two dozen or more uh, people who really couldn't be on the Trump jury because they would vote to convict before testimony. Like they're, they're there, <laughs> you know, those people are there. And way more news media than, you know, pro or con Trump people there. It was as, as quiet and peaceful a version of Foley Square and the courthouse campus area that you could ask for. Which is weird, because Trump promised on Friday that we were 72 hours away from all hell breaking loose. Yeah. And so maybe the hell mouth opened somewhere else. And we don't know. We haven't stumbled into it because there does not appear to have been a outpouring of Trump supporters at the courthouse for day one. And if they were going to be there on any day, it was presumably be on day one, right? Yeah. Day, day one is usually your maximum interest day uh, in these things. And when they drag on, uh, people, you know, at home start to fall asleep. Never mind the question of whether Donald Trump fell asleep in the courtroom today or not. Uh, but yeah, the the... The, the country is not at risk of any great uprisings. And let's remember, protesting this was legal in all 50 states today. So if you want to say there's only 85,000 Trump voters in Manhattan, which they are, that's how many he got, uh, and they were all busy, so none of them could come down. Or any, you know, But OK, what about the entire state of Utah? What about Alabama? <laughs> like. It was legal to protest. You could have a little march in Alabama or a giant one, you know, of all those yeah. Trump voters in Alabama or Idaho. Nowhere, not one place in the country was there a Trump voter who decided to say, I'm going to get up from my desk or my sofa and, and get out there publicly and protest this outrage in Manhattan. And I mean... It's, I feel like this is an important news moment, and I saw your post, the picture that you took of this today. I saw when you posted that online, and I was very happy that you did it. I feel like it is, there is an, a, a bias. It's like a law of physics. <laughs> it's not even like a, a political thing at all. But in the news business, you never report on the dog that didn't bark. Yeah. Right? You never report on the thing that didn't happen. But in this case, there is something observable that did happen, which is Trump spending the last year plus promising that the country would mm -hmm. be brought to its knees by Trump supporters turning out in numbers and with militants that you had never seen before from the American people. And this country would be torn apart if he were ever indicted and if he ever had to go to court and if he were ever put on trial. He's just he's asked his supporters to do it. And he has promised over and over and over again that they would at every step of his legal jeopardy. And they, over and over and over again, have not. And that, it, that dog not barking is a, is a story. Here. Yeah, and, it, and it's a good story for where we are uh, in, in this country now, that, that Trump voters will vote for him. That's all they're willing to do for him. There were some real nuts who were willing to do a lot more than that, violent people who were willing to do a lot more than that on January 6th. A lot of them are in prison right now. Uh, but if a lesson needed to be learned, it was learned. Uh, but, you know, they're just not going to get in their cars and drive to the courthouse. Uh, and they, they certainly, you know, didn't do that in Atlanta. They didn't do it in Florida. They're not going to do it in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., we know there's going to be many more anti-Trump protesters at the Washington, D.C. courthouse than possible pro-Trump Trump, uh, supporters there. Uh, and so it, it's really the most disappointed person in the country for all of this, of course, is Donald Trump, who really, really wanted to hear some noise out there today.
Yeah. I mean, he may console himself by thinking maybe they were all home trading Trump media stock. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why they couldn't do. They were just busy <laughs> right. by saving up for the Bibles or whatever. Right. But other than that, yeah, he didn't, right. he didn't get what he asked for here. And when you ask for something and you don't get it, that's embarrassing. And that should be a news story. Well, Adam Klasfeld was there uh, and he's going to join us tonight. He's going to be uh, at the courthouse every day of this trial. And he's going to be reporting nice. for us on what he got there. And of course, Andrew Weissman will be joining us with his wisdom on what happened there. And we're going to get straight to that. All right. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Well, Civil War was number one at the box office this weekend. And we proved once again today that the only place we're ever going to have a civil war is on the screens in the movie theaters where that film is playing. Donald Trump would love to have a civil war of sorts over the criminal prosecution that he's facing now in Manhattan, he would probably love to have what he would call his term a bloodbath or something like what we saw on January 6th, an uprising that could shut down the courthouse, stop the proceedings maybe. But once again today, as I just said, Donald Trump got nothing. And he knew, he knew he was going to get nothing from his supporters, which is why he didn't make the public mistake of summoning them to Manhattan to gather outside the courthouse, a mistake that he did make one year ago when he was arraigned at that same courthouse and no one showed up to try to block that proceeding the way they tried to block the certification of Joe Biden's Electoral College win on January 6th. A year ago, April 4th, 2023, Donald Trump pleaded not guilty in that courthouse, and he pleaded with his followers to be there. But I walked down to the courthouse to see the crowd that gathered to support Donald Trump. It wasn't, it was a smaller crowd than I expected. I expected a small crowd. It was still smaller than that. The news media far outnumbered the Trump protesters then, all of whom were well-behaved, the protesters, I mean, as I expected. And I said then on this program that you had nothing to worry about with Trump supporters trying to cause trouble or violence at Trump trials. And we have more proof of that today. The criminal court where Donald Trump is being tried is in a campus of courthouses that include federal courts and state courts, all kind of close together. And in roaming the campus today, I found no more than a couple dozen Trump supporters and maybe more anti-Trump demonstrators, all of whom were very peaceful and usually very, very quiet. So peaceful and quiet that babies were sleeping in the shadow of a courthouse. Literally, babies sleeping. That was the first photo I took this morning on my morning walk to the Trump courthouse, the sleeping babies. And according to reporting in the New York Times and the Washington Post tonight, babies were not the only sleepers in the neighborhood. Maggie Haberman, who was in the courtroom, reports for the New York Times under the headline, A Weary Trump Appears to Doze Off in Courtroom. Former President Donald J. Trump seemed alternately irritated and exhausted Monday morning as his lawyers and prosecutors hashed out pretrial motions before jury selection in his criminal case. Mr. Trump appeared to nod off a few times his mouth going slack, and his head drooping onto his chest. The former president's lead lawyer, Todd Blanche, passed him notes for several minutes before Trump appeared to jolt awake and notice them. Under the headline, Trump seems to nod off briefly as prospective jurors get instructions, the Washington Post reports, quote, Former President Donald Trump closed his eyes and at times appeared to nod off Monday afternoon in a Manhattan courtroom as prospective jurors were instructed on what they would need to do to serve on the jury in his hush money criminal trial. Trump closed his eyes several times. He then abruptly caught himself and stiffened his posture. His attorneys, Todd Blanche and Emil Bove, re <clears throat> refilled his drink and gave each other an awkward look at the defense table. Awkward indeed. Unfortunately, the trial is not televised, so we have no video confirmation of the 77-year-old criminal defendant falling asleep in court. The trial will not be televised, and the revolution will not be televised. 
because they didn't show up. Not only are Trump voters no longer willing to violently revolt for Donald Trump, they will not even show up at his criminal trials. There are actually 85,000 Trump voters living just on the island of Manhattan, and none of them bothered to go down to the courthouse today. None of the Trump supporters I spoke to there are from New York. Other press accounts quote Trump supporters from Pennsylvania. So if you include eastern Pennsylvania and, say, driving distances of an hour and a half from that courthouse, there are several million Trump voters who live on Long Island and Connecticut and New York State and New Jersey and Pennsylvania who could easily have been at that courthouse today. Millions of them. But they don't care that much about Donald Trump. They'll vote for him, but they won't revolt for him. They won't even show up for him. And so Donald Trump has given up asking them to even show up at his trials. And instead today, he just asked them for money. Money, he told them, he would never need when he began running for president and promised to pay for his campaign himself because, as he said then, quote, I am very rich. Today, he asked for what he called a million patriots to send him money because he desperately needs it because he's not rich enough. But he didn't ask for any patriots to come to his courthouse because he knows they won't come. They just won't come. And that is a very good sign about just how stable this country actually is tonight. The first words Donald Trump heard in the courtroom today were from the clerk saying, this is the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump. The judge immediately denied the latest Trump motion, asking, him to, asking the judge to recuse himself. Judge Juan Marchand then moved on to some scheduling issues, saying he was not yet sure about a scheduling request, quote, regarding counsel's request that the court adjourn on Friday, May 17th, for Mr. Trump to attend his son's high school graduation, and Friday, June 3rd, to allow a member of the defense team to attend their son's graduation. I cannot rule on those two requests at this time. It really depends on how we are doing on time and where we are in the trial. If everything is going according to schedule without unnecessary delays, then I am sure we will be able to adjourn for one or both of those days. But if we are running behind schedule, we will not be able to. Of course, if Donald Trump had been more interested in spending time with his son in the first months of his son's life, instead of spending time with Stormy Daniels in those days, Donald Trump would definitely be available for his son's high school graduation this year. Donald Trump's son was four months old when Donald Trump spent an evening, spent an evening with Stormy Daniels that he just as easily could have spent with his four-month-old baby if he cared enough about that baby. In 1982, the New York State Supreme Court ruled on the case of People v. Parker, which established what has become known as the Parker warnings that a judge must give a defendant. Before the potential jurors were called into the courtroom, Judge Mershon gave Donald Trump the Parker warnings that he gave him when he was actually arraigned in that courtroom a year ago. The judge said, although you've already had the Parker warnings, I am going to repeat them at this time now that we're at a different stage of the proceedings. Today, we're going to begin to pick a jury. So these Parker warnings take on special significance. You have the right to be present during the trial. And that is an important right. It permits you to assist in your defense, to assist your attorneys in their defense of you. Do you understand Trump? Yes, sir, the judge. You can, however, on your conduct, lose that right to be present. If you disrupt the proceedings in any way, the law permits the court to exclude you from the courtroom and commit you to jail and continue the trial in your absence. Do you understand Trump? Yes. The judge, if you deliberately fail to appear here for trial, that will constitute a forfeiture of your right to be present. A warrant will be issued for your arrest. The trial will continue in your absence. And if there is a verdict of guilty, and you again fail to appear for sentence, you will be sentenced in absentia. And upon your arrest, 
a sentence will be executed and you will be subject to separate prosecution and separate punishment for bail jumping, no matter what happens in this trial. Do you understand that, Trump? Yes, sir. The judge. Thank you. 96 potential jurors were called into the courtroom. More than half of them were immediately excused after saying that they could not be impartial in the case. Of the 34 potential jurors who remained in the courtroom, nine completed answering every question on the judge's 42-question list. Leading off our discussion tonight, Adam Klesfeld, who was in the courthouse today and who will be in the court every day for us at the Trump trial. He's a fellow at Just Security. Also with us, Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He's an MSNBC legal analyst and co-author of the New York Times best-selling book, The Trump Indictments, The Historic Charging Documents with Commentary. Adam, uh, on this day, when things are just cranking up, we saw a bunch of rulings uh, before any of those jurors were brought into the room to go through those 42 questions. Uh, what was established by the judge in those rulings uh, before the jurors came in? One of the very interesting things about those rulings, Lawrence, was, of course, Trump has spent the lead up to this trial trying to discredit Judge Merchan and has been saying how unfair he is, how compromised he is. And what the judge did was created very uh, provisional rulings that in many instances were favorable to Trump. He ruled that Trump, in at least at this stage, uh, prosecutors cannot uh, mention one of the facts that you mentioned in your opening, that he had conducted this affair while his wife was pregnant. The, the prosecutors cannot mention also that with the affair with Karen McDougal, that uh, that took place uh, before the pregnancy with Stormy Daniels, it was after the pregnancy. In another ruling, uh, Justice Merchan had said that Trump can, uh, that prosecutors cannot show the tape from the uh, Access Hollywood mm -hmm. tape that precipitated the campaign being in a tailspin, but the prosecutors can describe it. These were very detailed rulings. The judge is very clear to observe the due process rights of the accused and in also giving the prosecutors a lot of runway to expand on their broader theory of the case, which is that this was an effort to influence the 2016 election, showing that this isn't only about uh, one payment, that this was about a, an effort with the release of the Access Hollywood tape to put out a bunch of scandals. And he really threaded that line carefully and in detailed form. Uh, let's, just to go to one of these rulings that the judge made uh, on at the pretrial stage to show how tentative they actually are. Uh, this is the ruling he made about um, not mentioning, the prosecution should not mention that Melania Trump uh, was pregnant while the Karen McDougal affair was going on, for example. And so the judge says, at this moment, I don't think, I think that the prejudicial value of that definitely exceeds any probative value. As you know, we never know how evidence will come in, what will happen on cross-examination, whether any doors will be open. But for purposes of why we're here today, at this moment, I don't believe that that is necessary. And Andrew, that seemed to be the note on many of these evidentiary rulings that at this moment, we're not going, we don't anticipate allowing that. But then he makes the point that, hey, on cross-examination, who knows, things can happen. Yeah, that's very standard um, in the sort of what are called in limine, pre-trial motions, where a judge will say what both sides can do and what they cannot do uh, for the moment. But then, depending on what arguments um, and what evidence each side decides to bring out, they can, as Adam said, open the door to 
evidence that was previously held to be unduly prejudicial, it can become relevant, because um, it's unfair for one side to then make an argument that could be responded to by the other side, but for that pretrial ruling. So, for instance, if, for instance, they were to say, well, the transcript of the tape that where the tape itself is not being allowed to be played, if for some reason the defense were to make some argument that the transcript's inaccurate or it doesn't reflect what Donald Trump actually said on the tape, that would open the door. I don't suspect that the defense lawyers here who are um, very experienced will do that, will you know, will open the door to it. But it's, it's really typical to have these kind of preliminary rulings to set the ground rules for both sides. Uh, uh, Andrew, now that we have the transcript, I guess we've had our hands on this transcript for over an hour or so of literally every word uh, set, set in the courtroom uh, today. Uh, is there anything in that transcript, now that we actually know uh, every word set in the courtroom, uh, that jumps out at you? Well, I think Adam's point that the judge uh, is being fair, ha has made rulings that were favorable to one side or the other, depending on what particular facts are, that uh, struck me as a very good sign. Um, I think he is no nonsense. For instance, the government made the argument that they still have not received discovery from the defense. The defense has to produce any documents that they intend to use in the case uh, to defend themselves. Um, and if they don't do that, they should be precluded. And what the judge did is said, you know what, you have 24 hours to produce that, the, like, no more games. If you do not produce every piece of evidence that you intend to use, it's precluded. So I thought that was a very strong definitive ruling um, by the judge. So I think he is going to run a very tight ship. He, he strikes me as somebody in the mold of Judge Kaplan, the judge who had the two E. Jean Carroll cases. So I think we're going to see a very efficient, um, a very efficient trial being conducted here. Adam, I, I've been in courtrooms where every minute of the day where when I finally see the transcript, I notice something that I didn't notice in the room because it moves at different speeds and sometimes you don't hear every word. Was there anything in that transcript after you got to review it where, where it kind of underlined or added to your understanding of what you were hearing? Well, I would say the proximity of those Parker warnings that mm -hmm. uh, you showed viewers a little bit earlier. Now, as you noted, these are these are warnings that the judge must give. Yeah. And in most instances, when the defendant is not the former president of the United States, would be right. quite mundane. Yeah. Uh, but it's quite extraordinary in this instance. Mm -hmm. And two things struck out struck to me when I was reading it in the transcript. One, it was around the time that Trump reportedly fell asleep. Yeah. I mean, this is toward the end of the morning session. Mm -hmm. This is a time when most reporters were observing him nodding off. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a striking thing to see the proximity between that moment and a former president of the United States being read these extraordinary things, a warning that he could be tried in absentia if he mm -hmm. uh, is just disruptive and that he could uh, warning about bail jumping mm -hmm. uh, that this followed a kind of, it's both extraordinary and totally mundane and that was what jumped out at me from a close read of the transcript. Yeah, no, I agree with you. In, in any other case, I would not have bothered to read the Parker warning, standard <laughs> issue. I just wouldn't have bothered. But he's saying this to a former president, and it, all these references to, we will come and arrest you for this, we'll arrest you for that, <laughs> we'll arrest right. you for that, kept going. We're going to squeeze in a break right here. We're going to be back with Adam Klasfeld and Andrew Weissman. We'll be right back. Adam Klasfeld and Andrew Weissman are back with us. Uh, so they got through nine jurors. Doesn't mean they've been accepted as jurors, but those nine have gotten through the entire 42-question questionnaire. It's more than 42 questions because there's sub-questions. How does the judge feel about getting through nine today? He said toward the end of the proceedings that they're running behind. He even warned that, uh, for example, the court has taken off Wednesdays to yes. deal with other things on his docket because yes. this is not the only case that he covers. Uh, but today, toward the end of the day, uh, there was an exchange with Trump's lawyers, and he did say that they're falling behind. Now, I don't know if he was saying that in specifically in relation to the pace of uh, 
jury selection and voir dire, or if uh, well, the morning proceedings held him up. But there's definitely a sign from the judge. Was he was he in the way he said it, holding the Trump side responsible for that? Well, I, I'll go back to it's in a way it's that's a totally valid interpretation, Lawrence, because early on in the proceedings, he did tell them uh, when Trump's lead attorney, Todd Blanche, was complaining about seeking pretrial clearance. Uh, they need to get clearance from the judge before filing any more motions. Mm -hmm. And and the judge said the reason that we're doing that is that you inundated us mm -hmm. with motions that are near frivolous, if not frivolous. Um, so that might be one of the things that uh, the judge had been saying in the subtext in that moment between him and uh, and Todd Blanche, saying that we're behind schedule. And he told him earlier in the proceedings, there's one reason we're behind schedule. Yeah. And he also said, if you want to go to the high school graduation, you know, don't delay things. Uh, Andrew, what do you make of the progress today? You know, I actually thought it was it was fine. Um, I want to make sure everyone understands sort of what's going on here. Um, there's this enormous selection process where the first cut is to try and make sure that you've weeded out everyone, which is called a for cause challenge. People who cannot be fair and impartial um, or say that they have such strongly held views that they really wouldn't be able to put those aside. So that's sort of one huge group. But then the second part is what's called in the law peremptory challenges. That is where both sides get a certain number of strikes where they can strike the potential jurors from the pool. And there, that's why there's all these questions that are not going to, you know, can they be fair and impartial, but just sort of gives the um, the plaintiff side and the defendant side, that is the state and Donald Trump, more information about the jurors. So we're, there's just a lot more to go because there's going to be these sort of two phases. And then finally, with respect to that second phase where both sides are sort of deciding who they want to strike, who they do not want to have on the jury, there can be some immediate litigation if one side or the other thinks that people are being struck because of improper grounds. And the, the, that is that the Supreme Court has said improper grounds are if you try to strike somebody, for instance, based on race. So I've had lots of cases when I was a prosecutor where certain defendants will strike as, as many black jurors, the prospective jurors, as possible. And that leads to what's called under the law a Batson challenge, named after Batson v. Kentucky, which is the case that you cannot use race as a criteria. So there's a lot more to come in picking this jury, and we'll see whether there are those Batson challenges where one side or the other accuses the other side of using race or some other improper means um, to try and strike and, and sort of form a jury improperly. And, and Andrew, uh, quickly, how long does it take to litigate one of those challenges if, if the prosecution or the defense uh, wants to uh, wants to go after one of those challenges that this this is based on race and we want to fight about it? Um, it, it is litigation that happens immediately, and there's no appeal. It happens right then and there. Um, one side makes the argument. They present the data to support it. You can be sure both sides are keeping track of what prospective jurors, what race, what gender, um, what uh, national origin uh, they are to see if one side or the other may be violating Batson. And, but it, that is a quick process. That is not, I don't think people should be worried about, oh, is this going to take weeks to mm -hmm. litigate? It doesn't. But it is, it is sort of very unpleasant litigation because mm -hmm. essentially one side or the other is accusing the other side of essentially, you know, it, let's just say, being racist in their conduct. Um, I'm not going to say, I'm not saying that will happen, but it does, um, it is something that is seen. It is some, the reason for the Supreme Court case is because unfortunately in this country, it is something that does happen and it is prohibited under the law. 
Adam Klassfeld, thank you very much for joining us tonight after your long day, 9.30 a.m. in the court tomorrow. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, Andrew Weissman is going to hang around for the next discussion. When we come back, Tim O'Brien will join us on Donald Trump's mounting money troubles and the, the question of did he post bond in a legitimate way in that civil case in New York. We'll be right back. Donald Trump has a deadline of midnight tonight to file with the New York Attorney General proof that he or his bond issuer is actually capable of paying the $175 million bond that he pretends at least to have obtained in his civil fraud case to prevent the Attorney General from seizing his assets, which the Attorney General can do if that bond is fraudulent. New York Attorney General Letitia James is demanding more information to prove to the court that the bond issuer, Knight Specialty Insurance Company, which is not licensed in New York, is qualified to pay the bond if Donald Trump loses on appeal. The Wall Street Journal reports, if Trump doesn't meet the Monday deadline to provide detailed information about the bond, then the Attorney General could begin enforcing the fraud judgment. Judge Ngoran will hold a hearing on this issue next week. And the New York Times is reporting today, quote, shares of former President Donald J. Trump's social media company plunged on Monday after the company filed to register the, poten the potential sale of tens of millions of additional shares. Investors reacted to the notion that if a flood of new shares were to hit the market, they could depress the company's stock price. Joining our discussion now is Tim O'Brien, senior executive editor for Bloomberg Opinion and author of the book Trump Nation. He is an MSNBC political analyst. Andrew Weissman is back with us. Andrew, uh, this filing, which we haven't seen yet, that should be coming in by midnight from Trump's attorneys, needs to explain whether that $175 million bond really is a guaranteed form of payment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, it is just so remarkable. This is somebody who has been found by two juries to have defamed somebody, um, who has been found to have sexually assaulted somebody, um, has been the company of which has been found criminally liable for a decade-long tax conspiracy criminally um, and has been found to have committed fraud, has to post a bond of $175 million, is on trial starting today for a criminal case involving 34 felonies, and he can't find a frigging company that is registered in New York, meaning that there is they are licensed to do business here, which it appears they are not, and that has the wherewithal to pay the money. Because remember, the whole point is that you either have to put up the money now or you have to find a bond company that is sufficiently liquid that the plaintiff can look to that bond company if at the end of the day, the judgment is affirmed. So this may have been just a sort of way of delaying um, the sort of enforcement mechanism if it turns out that they have, you know, that Donald Trump has gone to a company that is simply not qualified and liquid enough to do uh, business and to post this bond. It's really remarkable um, in this situation. This is the former president of the United States, and it, there really seems to be no end of the shenanigans that he will engage in. And Tim, is there any possibility of Donald Trump's uh, on paper earnings from this stock issue that's just come out that, that he's that he's part of? Is there any possibility of that intersecting with this and somehow supporting his ability to pay <laughs> this bond? Absolutely not. It's been tanking. You know, th this company came public in the murkiest of ways. It didn't come public uh, through a normal IPO process. It, it, it brought its shares to the public through a SPAC. I won't bore you with the detailed SPACs other than to say that there essentially dodges around the normal transparency and disclosure process and investors drop into companies that come public this way, supposedly knowing they're in um, 
you know, for lack of disclosure and lack of transparency. Um, since Trump media came public, it's dropped about 70 percent. And, and it is probably going to pl plunge much further, given its financials and, and given the performance of other companies that have come, uh, have made public offerings in this fashion. Maybe it won't. I'll, 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 I'll note I am not a financial advisor and I'm not giving financial advice. But if you just look at the trajectory of this, it's in very bad shape. And, and, and regardless of the price dropping, Trump isn't able to sell his shares unless the board decides to do some sink, hinky things that might get it in trouble with the SEC. He's locked up for about another five months or so. So this is all paper money, and he can't touch it. And then in the midst of all that, of all of this, um, we're, we're shocked to discover that Donald Trump is doing business with people who might not have the financial or business wherewithal to do what they say they're doing. Uh, the very language of this bond contract indicated that that Knight might not even pony up the money should the state of New York need to collect it, that it would default back onto Trump. So that's a problem. The company hadn't been properly vetted in the state of New York. That's a problem. Um, and they, I guess I, they have about 90 minutes or less now to file the paperwork demonstrating they have the wherewithal. And if they don't, Tish James, New York State Attorney General, tomorrow can try to find other avenues for collecting the money that that residents of the New York residents of New York State to be guaranteed will be paid. The whole thing is a mess, and he doesn't have many good avenues financially for getting around this right now. The clock is ticking on Donald Trump in so many ways. Yes. Tim O'Brien and Andrew Weissman, thank you both very much for joining our discussion tonight. Thank you, thank Lawrence. You. You're welcome. And while Donald Trump spent his day as a criminal defendant in a Manhattan courtroom, the Biden-Harris campaign was on the move today. Vice President Kamala Harris was in the crucial state of Nevada, reminding voters there that Donald Trump is fully responsible for overturning Roe versus Wade and threatening reproductive rights for women throughout the country. Simon Rosenberg will join us next. Today, with 203 days until the November 5th election, Donald Trump, Republican nominee for president of the United States, was sitting at a defense table in a Manhattan criminal court as a criminal defendant. And the Biden-Harris campaign is out moving across the country, talking about the issues that matter the most. Vice President Kamala Harris returned to Nevada for the fourth time this year, an important state where she told voters that the abortion bans that we are seeing in states like Arizona came from Donald Trump. Let's be clear then that when he sits back and most recently says, well, I believe that the state should make these decisions, he says, right? Okay. So you believe that the states have a right to reinstate laws from the 1800s? to criminalize health care providers, to provide up to prison for life, no exception for crimes of violence to someone's body. So let's all be clear. What we are seeing in these states that we are talking about are Trump abortion bans, and he can't get away from that. Those are Trump abortion bans. Trump abortion bans. While in Las Vegas, Vice President Harris, an Arizona state senator, Ava Birch, spent time canvassing for signatures to get a measure on the November ballot to codify abortion rights in the Nevada Constitution. Here's what Arizona Senator Birch said last week when the Arizona Supreme Court supported an abortion law written in 1864, long before Arizona became a state. Good morning. I'm State Senator Eva Birch. A couple weeks ago, I had an abortion, a safe, legal abortion here in Arizona for a pregnancy that I very much wanted, a pregnancy that failed like many of my pregnancies before it, an embryo that was dying and a miscarriage that was destined to happen, somebody took care of me. 
Somebody gave me a procedure so that I wouldn't have to experience another miscarriage, the pain, the mess, the discomfort. And now we're talking about whether or not we should put that doctor in jail. This is outrageous that we would even dignify the consideration of this type of ban. And here's what Senator Birch said in Nevada today. The decision to choose when and how to start a family belongs to each of us as individuals. It belongs to you and it belongs to me. But they will stop at nothing. They will stop at nothing to take it away from us. And it's about control. And this can happen anywhere. What's happening in Arizona is not unique. It's happening all across the country. And it's another hurdle in the fight for reproductive freedoms. But it will not set us back if we keep pushing forward, if we keep pushing back. We must reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to protect abortion, not just in Arizona or here in Nevada, but nationwide. This is the fight of our lives, and I am here for it. Joining our discussion now, Simon Rosenberg, a Democratic strategist and author of Hopium Chronicles on Substack. Uh, Simon, the fight of our lives, when you listen to Senator Birch, when you listen to the vice president speaking on this, uh, it, it just could not be a more urgent issue in the terms that they put it. And there's Donald Trump sitting in a criminal courtroom, has no running mate to be out there the way the vice president is out there. Donald Trump sitting in a criminal courtroom in Manhattan. First of all, <clears throat> this is a tough segment to follow. I mean, those were amazingly powerful and emotional words that we just heard. Um, and I think, listen, I think that part of what, I think this has been a very bad month for Trump. I mean, not only has he had this trial, which you covered very well today, I think what happened with abortion over the last 10 days is far worse. For, may be the thing that broke the camel's back. It may be the thing that really set Trump off on a path to lose this election. Because what he did in his idiocy, right, in his diminished state, is he believed he was going to come out and sound like a moderate, right, that he was going to leave it up to the states. But what he was really doing was affirming and, and endorsing the most extreme abortion restrictions in the entire country. And so he confirmed for all of us that he is the most powerful and virulent abortion extremist in America. That was something that we didn't necessarily know. Yes, he had ended Roe, right? We knew that. But now he's affirmed in front of all of our eyes, right, that he is the most dangerous extremist on this issue in the country. And that's not something that they're going to be able to wiggle out of now, because he is now for the Idaho ban. He's for the Arizona 1864 law. And if he can be for those laws, then he can be for banning abortion across the whole country. And so I think the, the election changed. It's going to take a little while to move through the polling. But I think this was a definitional moment for him, where he made it very clear that if you were worried about MAGA and voted against MAGA in 2018, 2020, and 2022, and 2023, the MAGA that we're seeing today is far more dangerous and more extreme than any other earlier version of MAGA. It's a huge problem for them, and it's another reason why I remain deeply optimistic about what's going to happen this election. Simon Rosenberg, we are out of time. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. We'll be right back. Breaking news at this minute, Donald Trump's lawyers just filed that brief we were discussing with Andrew Weissman that justifies, argues in justification of that bond that he has filed in his $175 million judgment that he's appealing in that civil case in New York. We'll have more reporting on that tomorrow. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.